And turn with me, if you would, in your copies of God's Word to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20 is found on page 407 in the Bibles provided. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. As Pastor Derek is away on vacation uh, for this week and next, I, I'd like to turn to this chapter, 2 Kings chapter 20. And as we turn there, you may wonder if this is history that we've already covered. Uh, those of you who've been around a while rem- will remember that when I first came, uh, or near then, I, I preached through Second Chronicles, and-, and that does cover the history of Hezekiah. And so you may think, well, w- are you just repeating sermons, uh, Pastor Joe? Admit it if you're doing so. Well, I'm not. Uh, I want you to know that uh, though Second Chron- or First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings may at times appear to be covering the exact same history, it's maybe an exact duplicate, and there are there are several passages which are the same in both places. Uh, that's not true of every passage. Uh, this passage that we're looking at uh, this evening and next Lord's Day evening is a passage that the chronicler didn't uh, include in full, although he did summarize it. Uh, well, we may reference that uh, this evening. Uh, but that, uh, interestingly enough, this passage isn't found in Second Chronicles, but it is found in Isaiah. Isaiah 38 and 39 uh, are a near exact parallel with Second Kings 20. Uh, So I'd like to preach uh, uh, these evenings uh, two events in the life of King Hezekiah. Uh, And these are ones which I I came across, which I trust uh, those of you who are reading through the Bible in a year, you've probably had passages that stuck out to you. These stuck out to me, not only in my reading of them, but uh, also in several conversations, just how applicable they are. And so uh, let's uh, hear now as I read from God's holy and inerrant word, uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. This is the word of our God. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came and said to him, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die. You shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, Please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, bring a cake of figs and let them take and lay it on the boil that he may recover. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And Isaiah said, this, will be this, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps? Or back ten steps. And Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen ten steps. Rather, let the shadow go back ten steps. And Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord, and he brought the shadow back ten steps, by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray for his blessing upon him. Gracious God, we praise you that you uh, that this book that we are we have just read is the one where always in its reading the author is present. Lord, we pray that you would especially manifest your goodness to us. Lord, that we would uh, we would know uh, that we would have that same spirit by which this was inspired. Lord, that you would fill us. Lord, that you would convict us of the truth that is here. Lord, that we would know you, the living God. And Lord, that you would stir up your people to pray. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Uh, Friends, some of you know Rob Haynes. Rob was a ruling elder uh, whom I served alongside when I was pastor of the Wichita congregation, my previous call to this congregation. Some of you may know that Rob was diagnosed with brain tumors two years ago. And since that time, he's had surgery. He, for an extended period, wore a device that applied a magnetic field to his brain, uh, part of his treatment. Uh, He took various medicines and chemotherapies. And a bit over a week ago, he was put on hospice care. I had the pleasure of visiting him. And he is weak in body. He has some memory issues. But I saw this. He has the heart of a shepherd. His wife, his wife was testifying that day and night he was praying for everyone he ever knew. And he was, in talking with him, you could tell that he was thinking of everyone else but himself, sometimes overcome with emotion. Before I even knew I would be meeting with him, though, God had already had me thinking of this passage, a passage about a king who is told he's near death, a king who prayed. And this, message, this passage has a message for all of us this evening, that we are to look to our shepherd, that we are to look to our praying king. And so, dear ones, look to your praying king. This passage begins on a sickbed. King Hezekiah, an heir of David's throne, a reformer, as he's recorded in the book of Chronicles, who has labored to restore God's worship, appears to be at the very end of his life. And this appears to be a certainty affirmed by God's prophet. Verse 1, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die, you shall not recover. And friends, I want you to think about uh, if you were a citizen in that kingdom, you knew that your national leader, he is going to die. You, you've, you, maybe you've even heard the whispers of the, 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 the word that he had received from the Lord, that, that his, his life is near its end and, and, uh, and you tremble. What's going to happen to the kingdom? What's going to happen to us if our leader who's, who's led us, who's brought us victory, what if he is taken out of the picture? Friends, this is a command to set your house in order. If we know we will die, and and, and who of us in this room knows we won't? We should set our affairs in order. We should be ready to be with the Lord whenever he may call. And there may be practical steps uh, toward that. Being ready for death, or readying your household, readying your finances, uh, having a, a short list uh, of offenses, uh, you know, confessing your sins, forgiving those that need, you need to forgive. Uh, try, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We should be those who are setting our houses in order, knowing our own mortality. And yet, praise the Lord. This passage doesn't end as it began. It ends by this same king, Hezekiah, receiving another 15 years. And that raises the question for some. Some have struggled with this. Asking the God who said at the beginning of this, you, will, you shall die, you shall not recover. Is God mistaken? Quite literally, God has his prophet turn around. Does that mean that God corrects himself? Well, I want to deal with that concern first and say no. This passage instead details that God can foretell a contingent future. Friends, God is never wrong. God never lies. Every word of God proves true. We should sooner expect the sun to turn black and the mountains to jump in the air than for God to say falsehood. Neither can it be, I do want to say even more than that, I want to say that neither can it be that God's prophet is mistaken. Isaiah, I mentioned that this passage is duplicated in Isaiah because it is Isaiah who is going to him, that same Isaiah that we have a whole book of the Bible from. And so God did indeed say uh, uh, what to do if a prophet speaks presumptuously. If a prophet is wrong in Deuteronomy 18.22, he said, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, then that word that the Lord has, that, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. 
And he says in that same passage, that same prophet shall die. Friends, if God is wrong here, then we would be right to tear the whole book of Isaiah from our Bibles and burn it. We would lose, I, I trust you know from Isaiah, we would lose glorious promises, the promise of the virgin birth. We would, we would lose God detailing the suffering servant who would bear our sins. All that would be as not if this word is not true. If indeed Isaiah were a false prophet, if God were to tell a lie. So how then do we understand this? Let me give you an illustration. Suppose you're driving down I-35, and I happen to be a privileged passenger. I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and uh, you're, you're, you're just driving along. Maybe we're talking. Maybe you're distracted, and there's a slowdown ahead of you, and I say, stop. You're going to crash. You slam on the brakes. We avoid an accident. We're, we're still living to tell the tale. In hindsight, when I say, said, stop, you're going to crash, was I wrong? Well, no. I was absolutely correct in telling you what would have happened. None of you are going to berate me as if I'm telling you something false after that experience. Because I, I, I said what needed to be said in order to get you to stop. I said the truth that would have happened because that most surely would have happened if you didn't take the right action. Similarly... I think we are, and I think everyone there that heard this originally understood this to be God by his prophet telling what would have happened if Isaiah didn't respond as he does in this passage. Now, why? Why would God do this? Well, just as I would shout, stop, you're going to crash, it is to elicit a response. Notice with me, if you remember uh, elsewhere in your Bibles, uh, this is something God does at times. God did something similar by the prophet Jonah and, and to Jonah's chagrin. <laughs> remember, after being in the belly of the fish, Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and he delivered God's message. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now that, that sounds like judgment without the possibility of mercy. And yet what was the response? They repented. This, this ungodly, this, this city that where, where, where they were enemies of God's people, they, they dressed in sackcloth from the king down to the beasts. Uh, every one of them, they covered themselves in sackcloth, and God had mercy. Even though jo Jonah uh, hoped for judgment on that day 40. No, God actually showed mercy. The message carried, got to its goal. It got them to respond in just the way they should have to avoid the contingent future to avoid that judgment which most surely would have come had they not repented. Or similarly, we might consider Israel and Mount Sinai uh, when, when they had made the golden calf. As Moses later narrates it, uh, God told him, let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven and I will make of you, make of Moses, a nation mightier and greater than they. That sounds like a pretty interesting opportunity for Moses. He could, he could have a whole nation to himself. He, he, could, he could start over, get rid of all these rebellious Israelites. But actually, it drew the right response. Moses interceded. He prayed for God's people. And so rather than being enriched himself, it was God's people that were blessed with mercy. God showed mercy by eliciting the right response from Moses. Not, not because God is telling a falsehood, because God is saying what would have occurred had uh, Moses not done what, he was, what God intended him to do. Now, friends, we could, we could look for other examples in the Bible, but we, I think we all need to recognize that there, would, there is a contingent future for all of us. You, dear ones, all of us, me, should the Lord tarry, you're going to die. You need to set your house in order. And, and if, if the Lord hadn't died for us, if we hadn't repented and, and, and been covered by the blood of the Lamb, we, you, we would go to hell. That would be a most assured, assured future if we do not respond to the free offer of grace given in Jesus Christ. Friends, had not Jesus been our righteousness, our atoning sacrifice, had not Jesus risen from the dead, we would be eternally separated from God. Had not the Holy Spirit brought us to repent and believe, we would surely uh, experience that as our future. Friends, here is a reminder that we may have the duty 
of telling people their contingent future. You might say to people things that they might not like to, like to hear, things, things like, if you continue in this sin and don't repent, you cannot call yourself a Christian. If you continue in this reckless running from God, you're going to perish. Stop! You're going to crash! And friends, that is a good thing. It's a good thing if we say that to people because it's true. And yet it may elicit from them the right response, the response that God desires from, the, 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 the response that God himself would have ordained from before the foundation of the world, the response that God meets with mercy. Friends, I don't think we should expect people to respond rightly if the truth of where they're headed is withheld from them, if we are silent. So praise God, Hezekiah responded rightly. And how was that? It was with tears and prayers. And so next I want us to see that God hears tears, sorry, sees tears and hears prayer. Hezekiah prayed. And again, if you know the history of Hezekiah as, as, as a person in his lifetime, you know that this was characteristic of him. When Sennacherib's forces are threatening Jerusalem, Hezekiah prayed and the angel of the Lord struck them down. God heard the king's prayer and he delivered his people. He's done that several times in the past. Uh, and, and so we see him acting in accord with his character, this good character that we know of this king. And notice a, a few details here. He, he turns toward the wall. Now, obviously, if he's interacting with the prophet, you know, he's speaking to him. Why would he then turn to the wall? You know, if I were to just turn around like this, what would that communicate? It's that I'm not talking to you anymore. Hezekiah is turning to God. This is why this detail is recorded. The object of our prayer must be God. You can't go through any, any other uh, human uh, mediator except the Lord Jesus. You, you can't, you can't uh, pr say you're, that you're praying if you're talking to saints or other uh, objects, uh, idols. Uh, he turned to God as the object of his prayer. And that was that he was also sincere in his prayer. We, we read here that he wept bitterly. My friends, often uh, we recognize that sincerity alone doesn't do it. You actually do need to be praying to God. You do need to, to, to be, you can be sincerely wrong. But here, there, there's the right, the right matching of the heart and head. There's the right matching of, 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 of Hezekiah praying toward God and praying, uh, pouring out his heart toward him. Uh, friends, uh, this is the prayer that God heard. This is, these are the tears that, that God gathered. Now, friends, I want you to hear this as an encouragement to pray to God. When your soul is, is confronted with, 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 with sorrow, when you, when you see a, a truth that, that, that this is what's ahead for me, and, and you, you're tempted to despair, this is a time, as any is a time, but especially turn to God. Turn to him who sees Turn to him who hears, who heard Hezekiah's prayer. And friends, can we not testify, even in this room, of how God does hear prayer as he did Hezekiah's? My friends, I think of how we as a congregation, we prayed for April. And God, God, God heard, God, God, God gave her every day from then to now. I think of Elder Rob, and I think of how two years ago we were praying we got the di he got the diagnosis. We were praying, Lord, would you bless the surgery? Lord, would you bless the, 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 the treatments he was going through? And in many ways, God heard. God extended his life to today. And who knows how many more days yet. Friends, even, even just little things. You know, recently, my family flew to Scotland and back, and, and, and you were praying for me. I know you were. I think of so many ways. I, I've forgotten the number of ways that God answered prayer. I mean, even, even things uh, like, like the plane going over. Uh, there, there was a strike, and, and they actually had to get a different plane for us. But it, we got there. Praise the Lord. Friends, surely, surely you can tell me ten times as many how many ways God has heard your prayers. Praise God. This is the God we serve. He's not the God that, that's still and frozen and, 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 and cares nothing for his people. He hears you. And so, dear ones, don't harden your heart to him. How much does this encourage us? Pour out your soul to him. 
Come to him with your very greatest of burdens. Friends, even that last enemy, death, is that any, any, anyone that, that God himself will not uh, hear and help his people in the face of. And so Hezekiah had been heard in the past. And yet these former situation, in these former situations, we're not told exactly what it was that Hezekiah said in his prayer. But we are here. And that should then make us pay all the more attention. What, what is it that Hezekiah is praying? And here's the surprise. Hezekiah pled his righteousness. Let, let, let me read it for you. He says, I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. Now, which of us can say that? Uh, which of us uh, can, can say, Lord, you should hear me because I'm righteous. You should hear me because I've done good. Now, a surprise may be that, uh, that he would pray that way, and, and yet uh, you can look at the, the chronicler and how he records Hezekiah's life. And granted, he's being selective in what he shares, but he does say uh, there's a picture of a man who has been faithful. Hezekiah was a good king. He cleansed the temple. He restored the sacrifices. He restored the Passover that had been neglected by God's people. He organized the Levitical priests uh, who were obviously disorganized at that time. They weren't doing things as they should. All this, we're reminded again and again, was done according to the word of God. That's what Reformation is. Uh, we're, we're finding things that aren't being done as God had commanded. and we're, they're, they're, We restore them to that. And Hezekiah did that. And he did it with a whole heart. But even as great as that was, how can Hezekiah, a mere man like you and I, plead his own righteousness? Well, friends, I think he can if he's showing us a different king. If he's foreshadowing uh, one who can plead his own righteousness and for his own perfection will be heard in all that he prays. What I'm saying is that Hezekiah I think, is, is, is put in this position. God, God gives him the revelation. God draws this response from him so that like Moses before, who was a, a type of Christ, that Hezekiah can similarly show forth what Jesus does. Jesus can plead a righteousness before God. Jesus, who is the ultimate reformer. Jesus, who cleansed the temple, who rebuked those who had, for the sake of their tradition, made void the word of God. Jesus abrogated all that system of animal sacrifices and, and, and the temple and the Levitical priests for what was far better, the, the sacrifice of himself. All those were types and shadows. Uh, they were only showing forth his righteousness, which was yet to come. And so he is indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so God, in hearing Hezekiah's prayer, I think God is showing his people to look for a king like that, to look for a king who's better than that, uh, better because Hezekiah is not perfect. We'll see that next week. Hezekiah was heard, and so shall King Jesus be heard. During his lifetime, you may know some of the prayers that Jesus gave, and, and that's a, a glorious thing when you see the son calling to the father and, and knowing that God's going to hear him. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. At the crucifixion, that means that, 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 that among those thousands who were, were there shouting for his crucifixion, you fast forward to the Pentecost, and, and those are the same ones who are going to be cut to the heart. Those are the same ones who are going to repent and be baptized because Jesus' prayer got heard. Because Jesus asked that that happen, and God will hear and answer every prayer of Jesus Christ and say, yes, I will do that for you. Friends, remember that this same Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you. Friend, you may have been a, you, you can maybe envision yourself as a citizen of that kingdom and, and Hezekiah is on his sickbed and you, you would hope that Hezekiah's prayer would be heard even if you're not at the palace to see him praying, even if you're not there to, to witness as, as he is healed. Friends, likewise, we, we can't see Jesus where he is now. He's hidden from our eyes, but he's praying. We're told that. And his prayer is for you, for your sanctification, for your growth in grace, 
that you would be held even as Jesus prayed for Peter. He said, I prayed for you that you would not turn away. He prays for you, dear ones, and his prayer will be heard. Friends, take comfort from this. We have a better king than Hezekiah. We have this king, this king who Hebrews 5, 7 says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Friends, we have the righteous king who will be heard. He prays for you as your king so that if we are united to Jesus, if we pray in Jesus' name, we can have assurance that we are, will be heard. This is why we have any reason to pray to God, is that we have a righteous king. We have a righteousness before God in him. God hears our prayers because God hears his prayer. Indeed, this is why God collects our tears in his bottle. He cares for you as one to whom he has redeemed, who is, who's join, he's joined to, to Christ's body, with Christ at your head. And so if Christ will be heard, you will be heard in him, and all that we pray according to his will. And God will get his glory. God says, I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Let's look at these in reverse order. Uh, he says he'll do it for David. And that's an odd thing to happen for God to say in the time of Hezekiah because David is long dead at this point. And that's a reminder that men die, but God's words do not. And indeed, all who die are living in him. Uh, this may be a, a parallel passage to uh, where Jesus was quoting from the, 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 the passage of the burning bush that uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are still living. There, there's, a, there's hope after death. But let's also remember that what made David special was that God had made promises to him. And so God is saying here that he's going to be faithful to those promises. Promises including that God would bring us a Messiah from David's line. And so think of it this way. That line is going to pa- must pass through Hezekiah. And so God is going to heal Hezekiah for the sake of David, but also for the sake of the son of David. He's doing this for the sake of Jesus. Friends, if Hezekiah died... And this line of kings coming from David died off, then God's promises would die with them. Friends, God would sooner make the sun turn black in the sky. God would sooner make disease itself die. God would sooner raise the dead than let that happen. We see here that God acts for the sake of his promises. He moves that, that the things that he has said will happen will happen so that we, 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 we combine that prayer and, and, and the word in, in a way that, that, that is glorious and, and it's beautiful because we're hearing from God, this is, this is what you said you'd do. I, I remember a dear brother giving me a, a helpful illustration of this and uh, it goes like this, that there's, there's a father on a farm and his, his son is going to inherit it and his son has heard his father, you know, in the days of his strength, uh, talk about all the things that we're going to do. You know, we're going to build a barn here. And, and, you know, over here, you know, right now, this, there, there, there's some, some ways that we can develop this land. We can, we can increase this. And, and this is what we're going to do, my son. And you find time goes by and, you know, things come up and dad, dad hasn't done it yet. You know, we haven't, we haven't gotten the lumber yet for the barn. And the son keeps telling the father, dad, you said you'd do this. Will you not? Are, when are we going to get started on the barn? When are we going to develop this land? Father, you said you'd do this. Will you not do it? Now, even though it may come that a a farmer might not keep his word, that does happen. God will keep his. And so we as children, we hear what God says. God, you said you'd do this. And so we have assurance. He's going to act in accord with his word. And notice also, he says, I... I will do this for my own sake. I will defend the city for my own sake. Dear ones, this reminds us that God is motivated by God. God does things not because we're so great. He does things because he is great. Friends, if it sounds wrong that God is motivated by God because it would sound wrong if we do it, you know, I I do things because I want to. If that sounds wrong, it's because I'm not God. That's why it's wrong for us. 
But rather, God is God. God must do all things for his own name's sake, because what other purpose could be higher than his? I mean, what could motivate God to create the world when there is no world? There is nothing outside of him. God must be motivated by himself. And indeed, that that tells you that everything that has come to pass is because God wanted it to. God willed it. The, The highest, the biggest thing is God's own will. That 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 he will get his glory. That he causes all things to happen for his name's sake. This is why he promised Jesus. This is why he's giving a picture of Jesus and Hezekiah. This is why he's hearing Hezekiah's prayer. This is why he hears your prayers too. Friends, God's going to be glorified. God's going to get his glory as being the one who has mercy and concern for the tears of his people. He wants to show himself to be that God. He wants to show before a watching world that that God distinguishes between his people and, 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 and those that are far from him, that he, he hears with mercy our cries. And, he, and there is none other that is more merciful than him. This is the greatness of God. This is for his glory. And yet Hezekiah is a man like us. And so lastly, we're going to see that God accommodates his need for assurance. How does Hezekiah know these things will happen? And we see here that God uses means and signs. Friends, God knows our infirmities. He knows we're not God. He knows we're creatures. He knows that we, we're used to seeing and feeling and tasting and touching. And, and, and that's, 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 that's part of being human. And it's good for us to be human. It's not good for us to try to be God. We, we do terribly at it. And so God accommodates himself to Hezekiah's needs by giving these signs, by giving a means by which uh, this healing will be experienced by him. And, and even at the outset, I want to remind us that God gives us means too. God gives us signs, even in the Christian faith, even in these spiritual truths that, that are revealed to us by the application of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wakes us up. The Holy Spirit gives us new life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we believe these things. But at the same time, God gives us things that we can see and taste and touch because he knows that we're men, but mere men. And so some of you can remember when you were baptized. You can remember when you were washed, and as surely as, you, as, surely as that happened, God's promises are true. He washes us from all of our sin for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he regularly, he gives us another sign that we repeat and and we we eat and drink. And as surely as as we grow hungry, we, we uh, we need something to satisfy us. We need something to sustain us. So we recognize our need for Jesus Christ and his grace to sustain us. This is good of God to give these signs as he gives to, to Hezekiah. And he does so in two ways. One is an ordinary way, and the other is an extraordinary way. Now, first, the ordinary way. Essentially, God says by the prophet to make use of medicine. Isaiah says, bring a cake of figs and let them take it and lay it on the boil that he may recover. Now, you, you may be confused by that, wondering if I should... Uh, take some pavlova and lay it on my, uh, my, my, my boil. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. But ancient sources do record, like uh, Di- Diacitaries and uh, Pliny, they mention figs as a, as a usual remedy for boils of various kinds. And so essentially, we see that God here is saying, use medicine. And this is important. Because there are some people that think if, you're, if you are praying, if you, if you are uh, uh, spiritually uh, laying hold of God, uh, then, then there, to turn to medicine or to go to the doctor would be a lack of faith. But friends, the Bible doesn't present these things as mutually exclusive. Uh, Paul told Timothy, for instance, take a little wine for your stomach. Uh, James talked about anointing ail- ailments with oil, uh, which can have a medicinal value. There is, there is something to using means, using medicines. Uh, and part of that's just remembering God made medicines. And, and that's, that's a far thing from saying that we put our trust in the medicines, or much less that we put our trust in big pharma. Some of you may be concerned about uh, things going on and that sort. But friends, 
uh, it is to say that we believe that when we pray to God for, to satisfy our hunger, it's right for us to also eat. In the same way, we pray for God to heal us, even as we wisely use the medicines that he, in his common grace, has made available to all men. We use means. That's, that's, a, that's an ordinary thing. It's a good thing. And we should embrace that. But the second is extraordinary. Hezekiah asks for a sign, and God gives him an option. The option here, I, I think, is, is really, he says it in the terms of making the shadow go forward or backward, but really he's talking about making the sun go forward or backward. And sometimes God permits the recipient to choose the sign. A Gideon, uh, remember, asked for the fleece to be wet and the grass dry, and because he really wanted to know, he, he said it the next day in the reverse. Can you do it the other way around? And, and, and God was kind enough to comply. Ahaz is an interesting case because he's also mentioned in Isaiah. I mentioned that this passage is also in Isaiah, and that would form a contrast between Ahaz and Hezekiah. God told Ahaz to ask for a sign. God told him, ask as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Ask for something big, Ahaz. But Ahaz wasn't a believer. And Ahaz said, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test, which wasn't meaning a real concern about God. He was, he was basically saying, I don't really want a sign. He didn't really want to have anything to do with God's prophet. And so God condemned him while at the same time still giving a sign. And that sign is that the virgin shall conceive. That glorious promise actually made to a king that didn't want to hear it. Which is a wondrous thing. But Hezekiah is in contrast to that. Hezekiah is a model of faith. He asked for the harder sign. For the sun to go in reverse. This is a sign as high as heaven. Or consider Joshua 10 too, when Joshua asked for such a thing to happen during a battle, he asked for the sun and the moon to stand still in the valley of Aijalon, and God heeded the voice of a man. And that was unheard of then, an unheard of sense, until Hezekiah asked for the same thing, and God heard a man, heard him. Friends, by this, let us recall that there is nothing that is too hard for God. And there is nothing that Jesus will ever ask for God to do that God will not do. And even that is far more abundant. Even all that he will do that Jesus prays for is far more abundant than we can ask or think. And so friends, what is the takeaway from all of this? I think it is clear, isn't it? Should we not pray? If the nation is on a cri- has a crisis, it's falling apart, if our health is fa- failing or the health of leaders is failing, if we or the ones we love are, are about to die, let's cry out to God. Let's gather to pray. If we're concerned about the state of the church, if we're fearful for our families, if we see if we see that things aren't where they should be and we see that the only one who can do something about this is God and it would be for his name's sake, if we really are crying on him, God, you need to do something. Let's gather together and do that. Let's, let's pray as he taught us to. Our Father, Father, do something. Hear us, your children. And yet part of that prayer is knowing that Jesus, our King, is the one who's really doing the praying. He is doing the heavy lifting. He's already ever living to intercede. And he will be heard. As certainly as Hezekiah was heard, so will King Jesus be heard. And we can have confidence that not one of his prayers will be forgotten or ignored. And this gives us confidence as we learn to pray in his name. And God will get the glory from this. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Dear ones, look to your praying King. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we want to speak to you. Lord, forgive us. That intrusion of wanting to pray before men, wanting to pray to be seen. Lord, help us to pray toward the wall. Help us to pray so that you alone will see. Lord, would you help us where 
we, we're afraid of, 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 of disclosing ourselves. We, we, we keep back our tears. Lord, help us to see that you are merciful, that you heard Hezekiah, you heard Jesus. And Lord, you are full of mercy to all who come to you in him. Lord, hear Jesus' prayer. Lord, thank you that he is praying now. He's praying better prayers than I am, better prayers than we could. And you will hear every one, and they will be yes and amen. And every one of your promises will be fulfilled. And you, Father, you, O oh God, will get your glory and keep all of your promises. So, Lord, teach us in these things. Sustain us, especially in our time of sorrow, but all times. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.